1 Corinthians 15, and we want to go down here in uh, about um, verse number 57. Let's start there, 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. The Bible's been talking here in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection and uh, the impact of what the resurrection should have on our lives as believers. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, the Bible says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so one of the, one of the uh, results, the motivating factors of the truth of the resurrection of our Savior should be steadfastness in the life of the believer. Uh, we should be motivated to be faithful and to be serving uh, because all that we do is a result of his resurrection and all that we do has some form of eternal impact and uh, that should motivate us then to faithfulness but it's possible for us to not be so and we see that in second peter chapter number three uh in the uh, in first uh, corinthians 15 he's talking about the resurrection uh and our future resurrection that is the promise of coming blessing and then in second peter chapter number three uh, and these last verses he's talking about impending judgment future judgment and how that judgment should motivate us uh, to uh, faithfulness he says in verse 11 of second peter 3 seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of god wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat uh, and he goes on to talk about uh, how we should be looking to that promise in verse number 13 and all the way down to verse 17 where he says ye therefore beloved seeing ye know these things before beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness and so first corinthians 15 tells us to be steadfast to stay uh faithful to the lord uh because uh, of the blessing of the coming resurrection uh second peter 3 says be careful uh, because life's pretty tough the darkness is pretty dark and if you're not careful you'll end up falling from your own steadfastness failing in some way or another to be faithful to god through the days of your life that god has given you here uh, and so it is possible for us to fail in steadfastness and we have been looking at the illustration of that from psalm 78 and so if you'll go there please one of the fantastic if you want to use that word although it's not so fantastic uh, one of the fantastic illustrations of failing in steadfastness uh, was Israel through the, through the testimony of their history. And uh, many people have likened uh, their commitment to God like a roller coaster ride. And if you're not careful, you'll be seasick trying to follow the ups and downs of it. Uh, but um, we have looked at already some ways in which they failed in their steadfastness and more, more specifically, the attitudes that developed in their heart and life uh, that, that, that sowed the seed for that failure. And so we look uh, at verse 8 of Psalm 78, and the Scripture says that, uh, uh, that they might keep His commandments, verse 7, and, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a, rege a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God and then in verse 37 for their heart was not right with him neither were they steadfast in his covenant Lord help us today as we consider some continuing thoughts now to be uh, to be sensitive to an awareness uh, of these various attitudes that may develop in our life in the day when we need to be shining the brightest for the Lord Jesus Christ that may cause us to fail in our steadfastness lord i pray that we might be careful uh, to make correction uh, and to follow the right way and the good way uh, as we see the example uh, laid out before us in the life of the of the history of the nation of israel help me lord i pray please cleanse me of sin help me to be filled with the spirit and to speak your word as it is indeed your your word the lively oracles of God to these that are here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And so, look, the Bible tells us not to, uh, that we need to be steadfast. And 
uh, we, made, uh, we made clear in verse number 8 that their spirit was not steadfast with God. And in verse 37, uh, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. Uh, and here's the point. Steadfastness ultimately is a choice. If, if you and I fail in our steadfastness, basically in our faithfulness to God, in our commitment to God, in our consistency in our walk and service with God, if we do that, it is a choice. You, nobody's going to be able to point a finger at somebody else and see they may, say, they made me fail. They made me give up. They made me disobey. Now, Adam tried that in the Garden of Eden and found himself embarrassed by the whole thing. Lord, the woman thou gavest me. You know, all of these excuses that we uh, often give, we're going to find out, will not fly at the bema seat of Christ. They're just not going to do it. Uh, and it's not because God's honoring, uh, but God is a God of truth. And he wants truth in the inward part, Psalm 51 tells us. So you and I need to be careful to uh, live by truth first in our heart. Amen. Some people are trying to fix up the outside of their life without fixing their heart. You can't do it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what I want is steadfastness in my heart on the inside first. That will produce commitment and faithfulness to God. Well, we found out here uh, from these particular verses, especially verse 37, for their heart was not right with him. Their heart was messed up. Their heart wasn't where it should be, and as a, as a result, they were not steadfast in the commandment of God. So what was it that got into their heart? What was it that corrupted uh, their innermost being that caused them not to be steadfast to God? Well, we said, first of all, that they did not commit to being stalwart. We saw that in, uh, uh, in verse number 9, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. Uh, in other words, they would, they would not uh, be valiant in the fight. Uh, they were in it for their own good. Now, why in the world would you turn back in the day of battle? Uh, well, because the, to save self, <laughs> to preserve self. Uh, and we've seen it over the years in so many ways. Uh, uh, you know, in our own history, those that were not faithful, thank God, others that were, but nonetheless, they had not been determined to stick to the fight. And uh, the Bible says, though they were properly prepared, they had the bows here, they were armed, they were ready to go, and they turned back. We talk there about how that we have everything we need. We have the Word of God, we have the Spirit of God, we have the Lord's presence, we have the Lord's protection. We have everything we need to be faithful in this battle from the day we're saved until the day we go to heaven. Uh, so they, but they, they, they determined that they were looking out for number one first. They were looking for that which was, uh, made them comfortable, made them safe, and they, they turned away in the day of battle. They would not be stalwart. Then we said they would not be submissive there in verse number 10. They kept not the covenant of God and refused, is the word, to walk in his law. Uh, they refused to be submissive to the word of God, to the law of God, to the commandment of God. And in the end, again, just as with Adam in the garden, it's all a choice. Nobody can force you to disobey God. It's a choice. Now, there are consequences of both the, the, uh, the choice to obey him and the choice not to do so. Uh, and uh, many have chosen to obey him to the loss of their own life, to the loss of their job, to the loss of you know what they knew is familiar. Others have chosen not to obey him and be submissive to his law and then find themselves under the chastising hand of God. Either way, there will be consequences uh, sometimes for this choice, but they chose not to obey the covenant of God. And we said to disagree with God is to refuse him. Uh, the word of God is clear. Thus saith the Lord, you and I, <laughs> the Bible is not God's negotiation with man. It is God's law to man. And you and I don't, are not in no place to negotiate with him. Uh, so to disagree is to refuse. To deflect is to refuse. There are some people literally that think, if I can stay just as ignorant as I possibly can about the Bible, I won't have to answer for it one day. But the fact of the matter is the truth's laid out there. It's made available, and they'll be responsible for that availability. Uh, to delay is to refuse, we said. Uh, and then we said that they wouldn't be stirred. They would not be st uh, stalwart. They would not be submissive. They would not be stirred. And uh, they forgot. Uh, we, we looked at the word forget uh, there in verse 11 and verse 42. Uh, it just means that they it didn't move them anymore. 
It didn't move them anymore. Uh, and uh, this, for that reason, then, they began to murmur and complain. And uh, you and I will fall into that same cycle of, uh, of life uh, when we allow ingratitude to get into our heart and mind. We're going to soon uh, set the course uh, for failing in our own steadfastness when we fail to be thankful for all that God's given us, not the least of which is the forgiveness of sin and our salvation in him. Uh, and uh, we discussed not only their ingratitude, but their irresponsibility. They didn't apply the truth to their heart. That's why it didn't stir them anymore. It was uh, maybe just head knowledge or something that happened in history, but because they didn't apply it, uh, they, it, it lost its ability, uh, or they lost their ability to be stirred by it, even though they had been permanently pardoned, they had been presently provisioned, and they had been powerfully protected. Well, we come into this fourth section here this morning, and we want to talk about how that they would not be satisfied. And you see that in verse number 17. The Bible says, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God and said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Now, hold on, you know that he did. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. He gave them manna for manna. It's not whether or not God could provide a table. It's whether or not they would be satisfied with what God provided. That was the real issue here uh, at this particular point. And so they spake against him. Uh, verse 20, he smote the rock and waters gushed out, streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? And so the Lord had clearly uh, given them all that they needed. And in these verses, we see two ways in which that happened. One, God's manna. And secondly, God's man. Uh, God's manna is laid out for us uh, uh, here as he's talking about this uh, bread that they gave. Uh, verse 25 says, man did eat angels' food. Uh, he sent them meat to the full. So it wasn't as if God had given them manna and they were starving to death on it. The Bible's clear that they were full. They were satisfied. God had properly cared for them, but they wanted something else. That describes a great deal of modern Christianity, by the way. Not satisfied with the truth of God. They're looking for some new thing all the time. And the end result is a failure in gratitude for what God has given. And let's be clear that when God provided this manna from heaven, it was a, a miraculous provision. And all along the way, God had done so. Matter of fact, go back to Numbers, Numbers chapter number 11. Numbers 11, we look back into Numbers and Deuteronomy and Exodus and see these various illustrations discussed here in Psalm 78. Uh, but Numbers chapter number 11, and uh, down, uh, well, I should say beginning in verse 1, Numbers 11 and verse 1, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and it still does. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. The people cried unto Moses when Moses prayed unto the Lord. The fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Remember this mixed multitude from Wednesday night? And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept. Now, let me remind you, uh, it's not in my notes, so this is free. But the Bible says uh, that evil communications corrupt good manners. You get to hanging out with the wrong people, and the next thing you know, those people are going to influence the way you think. And this mixed multitude, in verse number 4, uh, were those that went out with the, um, uh, with the Israelites. They saw the hand of God upon them. They didn't necessarily believe in God, but they went out with them from deliverance. And before long, they began to stir up trouble in the camp. That's what we see in verse 4. Uh, the children of Israel also wept and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. You see all the discontent with it. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans, made cakes of it. The taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. 
In other words, the whole point of this uh, is that it was pleasant to eat, and uh, it was the kind of thing that you had some variation with. And some of you ladies, uh, maybe some of you men that cook, you'd appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, different ways to prepare it, different ways to eat it, different ways to enjoy it. God had taken good care of them. Fresh oil is the key phrase there. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon. Miraculously provided. And not just miraculously, but meticulously. Every night, God put it out there. Every morning, it was there just for them simply to pick up and to gather. Uh, and so God had provided in a miraculous and a meticulous way for them daily. Matter of fact, he said, now you're going to gather every day, and you don't gather on the Sabbath day. But uh, some of them went out on the Sabbath and tried to gather, and of course, God's judgment came. Others of them stored it up. Uh, they said, we're going to, maybe they were end time preppers. I don't know what they were, but we're here. what we're going to do is we're going to store all this up, you know, and, and save it for later. And it bred worms and, and stank because God wants us to trust him daily. That doesn't mean we don't properly prepare and all that. But the fact of the matter is there are more people that trust in their nest egg than trust in God. And that's what God did not want happening in their life. And so he provided for them day by day, uh, and uh, they said, our soul is dried away because of this manna. They said, we're tired, listen, listen, uh, that we're tired of God's provision in this way. Wow, what a heart of ingratitude. And so they wanted flesh to eat, and in the end, God gave them the flesh that they wanted, of course, um, uh, and uh, the Bible says he gave them uh, flesh and until it was coming out their nostrils, and, uh, and uh, he sent leanness to their soul. What was that leanness from? Griping. That's right. Griping. Griping and complaining and whining and moaning about how hard God's goodness is to you. Can you imagine such a strange a uh, thing in the same sentence, moaning about God's goodness. Wow, that's what they were doing. And it led to their failure, didn't it? They, the, because they uh, fell into this uh, uh, attitude of not being satisfied, uh, they eventually turned against the Lord and angered him, griped to him, griped about him. And the end result then was, of course, as we'll see probably tonight, they were set aside. And so they, God had provided for them his manna, and they did not appreciate it. And that ingratitude led them to fail in their own steadfastness. But then also was it not only God's manna, but God's man. And you see in verse number 20 of Psalm 78, verse 20 of Psalm 78, uh, the Bible says here that, uh, behold, he smote the rock. Now, God didn't smite the rock. Who smote the rock? Moses. Moses smote the rock. So here we find a reference to the, to the direction that God had given them through a man. Now, I don't have time to go through all the verses that relate to how they, how they did Moses. And... Uh, we'll focus on a few things just for emphasis on what we're talking about here. But they went after his marriage. They attacked Moses' wife. And um, it's clear that uh, if you look at Numbers 22, he, uh, you know, apparently he had taken an Ethiopian wife. Probably as they came out on the exodus there, he had taken her and, uh, and uh, they went after him. And not just anybody, uh, but his own sister and his own assistant. Miriam, uh, and uh, she, uh, and she, uh, and Joshua uh, went after him because of this woman, Aaron, excuse me, uh, because of this woman, uh, and uh, boy, what a bunch of turmoil's going on there, and uh, they, uh, so they began to accuse him about her, and as you study her, we don't have time for that this morning, you begin to find out that she, she was not a hindrance. In any way do we find that she was a hindrance to the nation as a whole. Um, 
we would have to say there was probably some racism involved in these attacks. She, but, but she was not a, a hindrance to the nation as a whole. We don't find anywhere where God's judgment was going to come on the nation because of Zipporah. We don't find that anywhere in the Bible. But she was a hindrance to Moses personally, and apparently she did not like the whole idea of circumcision. Because God um, had demanded this circumcision and, uh, and uh, she was not about to have that, and so somehow or another there must have been something going on uh, in that relationship between them. Maybe she said, we're not doing that, and I'm not going to let you do that. And so Moses trying to figure out what to do, and before long God was mad at Moses. And God said, basically, I'm going to kill Moses. Isn't that something? He didn't say he was going to kill her. He said, I'm going to kill Moses. And so she reluctantly yielded to that, no doubt, and uh, Moses followed through on the matter of the circumcision uh, but, uh, and, and, and was delivered from impending judgment by God. He had something going on there with the law of God and his wife. He's not the only one, by the way. We've already talked about, uh, we've already talked about uh, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Job's wife wasn't much of an encouragement to him. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Lot's wife, he couldn't get Sodom out of her. Uh, she kept wanting to look back to Sodom, and she became a pillar of salt. So here in each case, you find a man trying to follow God. He's got hindrance from his wife. Now, many times, it's vice versa. You have a woman trying to serve the Lord, and the man is the hindrance. But either way, there's not going to be any peace there. And somebody is going to, in order to keep peace, uh, will, likely, <laughs> will likely yield to disobedience to God. Now, not all are like that way. Thank uh, God uh, there for Abraham's wife, Sarah, who is illustrated in the Bible as submissive and loving and respectful of his leadership in 1 Peter chapter number 3 uh, and all of that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, there was uh, some kind of uh, strife and contention going on in here as it results to, as it relates to his uh, marriage, his family. And, but, um, uh, but that was just a small section of what happened. Uh, and uh, trying to undermine, trying to undermine God's man he chose. Moses didn't pick the job. I mean, it wasn't as if God sent out a job description and said, now put your resumes in. God went out on the backside of the desert and picked Moses, uh, the burning bush. Moses, Moses. Moses turned aside to see, and God chose him to go down and bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Let me tell you something, brother. And, and uh, if, if, God, if Moses had not followed God's leadership, those folks would have never come out of there. And yet, somehow or another, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't abide by that. Uh, once they got out of Egypt and got the, what they felt like was their feet and legs underneath them, boy, they turned on the man God used to bring them out. And uh, so they persecuted him as it related to his uh, family. Uh, and then they persecuted him and, uh, and, uh, and falsely accused him uh, of, uh, of, of, of false motives. We see that in number 16, uh, when they said to him in the first three verses, ye take too much, they accused him of self-will. I'm going to get to that in just a minute, time permitting. They accused him of self-will. You're just trying to be the big boss. You're trying to be the you know, big man on campus, and, and you're trying to get your way above everything else, above our way. Boy, you can just see the whole pride and contention thing stirring up here. Ye take too much on you. Now, it's interesting, however, comma, that God, that Moses' instruction came from God. They gave no thought to that at all. They said, Moses, you, you're out of line. Uh, and uh, so not only self-will, uh, they said this, Wherefore lift ye up yourselves? Not just self-will, they accused him of self-promotion. You're trying to make a name for yourself. You're trying to get a reputation. You know, you're trying to get on, uh, you're trying to get on Fox News. I don't know, I don't know, but they accused him of it. 
uh, him and Aaron as well, uh, they accused his motive. The whole time, Moses was saying, look, I'm minding my own business, and God put me in this. I was obeying God, and God put me in this. God called me. God chose me. And matter of fact, at certain points of judgment that came upon the people, God reminded them, I chose Moses. I called him out. I will talk to him face to face. And they, they would rather have accused him, <laughs> watch now, of the motives they had. And so he had given, he'd given this leader, they attacked his wife, they attacked his motives, they attacked his authority. That is the, the mandate that God had given them. Uh, look back at Numbers chapter 12 with me. Numbers chapter 12. And verse 2. This is a, almost an exact quote sometimes of what you hear today. Verse 2. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You go down there and look, if you will, at verse number 8. The Bible says, With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches. The similitude of the Lord shall, be, shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now watch. They said, uh, is, God, is, is, is Moses the only one that God's talking to? Is Moses the only one that God is talking through? You see what's happening here? They're, posi they, they're positioning themselves for a mutiny. That's what's happening. And this Moses has taken too much upon him, and he thinks he's the holiest of God, and uh, God uh, only talks to and uh, through him. In, in chapter 16, look at chapter 16, and in uh, and, and verse number 3, they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you. I quoted that earlier, seeing all the congregation are holy. All the congregation are holy. Who do you think you are? <laughs> well, every one of them, every one of them is holy. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. You see this whole point? Why are you making yourself all this? Who you think you are? We're all God's people. And uh, God, uh, the, the Lord is among us. And uh, we're all in fellowship with him. Which was a presumptuous statement. Because obviously that was not true. You know why? Because some of them went down. God judged them. They weren't right with God. They were trying to pretend they were, right? All, uh, as a matter of fact, the end of the, the end of result of this is we don't know, man. We don't know what's going on here. It'd been good for us if we just throw him off and get a new leader and go back to Egypt. And so they went after his mandate. And the whole time, in both cases, the attempt was to minimize the mandate and the authority of Moses by leveraging to bring in a New Testament quote, the priesthood of the believer. We all walk with God. We all know God. Why do we need a pastor? Why do we need a spiritual leader? Uh, you see all the, 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 um, uh, the lack of respect, but that's, that's motivated more than the respect. It's motivated by a lack of gratitude for God's provision for them. And, and then they thought he was weak because of his mannerism, you know. When they came out to attack him, he fell down before them. He was uh, the meekest man, the Bible says. Uh, and, um, but uh, that meekness is, was power under control. He fell before them in meekness, which really was spiritual strength. It was confident Restraint, Just like the Savior in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, when the Bible says he reviled, he reviled not again. Uh, when he suffered, uh, he uh, threatened not, but committed himself to God, basically. That's what Moses was doing. There's nothing I can do about this. 
If they're going to mutiny me, they'll have to stand for God on it. That's the only thing I know. God's one what put me here. Now, go with me to Numbers 20. Numbers chapter number 20 and verse 7. Numbers 20 and verse 7. And uh, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rock and ga- a rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Now there's a change in tone here with Moses. Hear now, ye rebels. Um, Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lift up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. Now he was supposed to speak to it, but he smote it, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, I make note of this passage of Scripture because up to this point, Moses had uh, exercised um, uh, a sense of humility until he took that attitude, you bunch of rebels. And he said, I guess we're going to have to do this to show you, right? And when he lost his restraint, listen, he lost his ministry. When he lost his restraint, he lost his ministry. Now, here's the thing. He finally let them get to him. And he got angry and made a mistake in angry judgment. And it cost him. It cost him the ministry. Now, the reason I pointed that out was because all these people had done, all of their uh, dis... uh, 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 dissembling uh, all of their uh, disrespect all of their undermining of Moses and all along the way God's trying to bring him along and then Moses uh, loses temper and in one act lost his ministry why well I put it down this way God does not suffer in his men what he long suffers in his people. And Moses knew it. I mean, here was a man that had been face to face with God. Here was a man that had the oar of God upon him after he had fellowship with God when he came down from the mount. God, you know, the Bible says, uh, to whom much is given shall much be required. God does not allow in his chosen leadership what he may seem to allow in the lives of others. Here's my point. We have a number of people here that serve in various ministries of the church. And as a servant in the ministry of the church, you are to be an example to those to whom you serve. So here's what that means. Others may be vengeful, but you cannot. Others may be spiteful, but you cannot. Others may be disrespectful, but you cannot. Others may be hateful, but you cannot. Others may be wrathful, but you cannot. Others may live according to self-will and seem to get ahead, but you can not. Though the servants of the Lord may be recipients of these things, they cannot under God be participants in these things. Others may, but you may not. 
The call to ministry is a high and holy calling. Uh, it demands a different approach to life, a different view of life. It requires a higher level of discipline, of self. It requires a higher commitment to the glory of God. It requires a different attitude and a different approach and different actions from those around. And if that bothers you, then your only option is to step down. Resign. Step aside. I mean, go on and do the best you can to go out in the world and live for yourself until judgment comes, whatever. But if you're going to be in the work of the ministry, uh, you're going to have to learn that um, God has a higher expectation of those that serve him. And you're just not going to be able to live like you want to. That's right. Moses proved it. <laughs> you're not going to be able to have the demeanor others have. You're not going to be able to dress like others do. Uh, you're going to have to behave yourself in a way that honors God. And if you don't want to do it, then that's your choice. Go on and just step aside and go do what you want to do. But whatever you do, stop blaming God and stop blaming people for your discontentment with the privilege of ministry. That's your only choice. And so... Uh, Moses recognized that truth. Moses had to uh, realize, and, and then when he lost that, when he lost that realization, he lost his ministry. Look at Numbers 11. Numbers 11. Now, can't you imagine? I don't know who and all heard that conversation <laughs> between God and Moses and Aaron. Because you chose not to sanctify me in front of these people, you're not going to the promised land. I don't know if it was just them, or I don't know who may have found out about it, but can't you see some of them gloating? Hmm. Yeah, we knew that guy was no good. We knew he had a, a selfish streak in him. We knew it. Numbers 11, and down in verse number 11, and... Uh, Moses heard the people weeping in verse number 10, and every door is tent, and anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. And Moses also was displeased. Watch now. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Here's his point. These are not my children. I didn't birth these folk into the world. And... Uh, have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Well, when should I have flesh to give unto all this people? That's the point. Here's what Moses is saying. I can't make them happy. Uh, there's no way that, that I'm going to be able to uh, appease this discontentment in them. Why have you put this burden upon me? Well, the fact of the matter is he never put the burden of flesh upon him. God provided manna all along the way. The people wanted food. We've already seen it was a rebellion against God's provision. Moses didn't know what to do. And <laughs> for they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. Verse 14, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, watch now, kill me. I pray thee out of hand, just throw me aside, kill me and cast me aside. If I have found favor in thy sight, God, God, if you'll favor me, kill me. Wow. And that's where it was. The burden was so heavy, and he couldn't find any path to, to provide 
what, uh, that for which they were looking. Now watch the last part, though. And let me not see their wretchedness. That's not what that says. Here's what Moses was saying. I can't do it, Lord. It's not, it's not them. It's me. Now, if you're the kind of servant of the Lord that goes, goes around looking at the wretchedness of everybody else, you don't have Moses' mindset. Your prayer and your mindset ought to be, Dear God, help me, just kill me so I don't see my own wretchedness. My own weakness before you. My own inability to, uh, to find your will and to know your direction and to, to, uh, uh, to guide and to move forward. God, I, I, I don't want to see my own wretchedness. That's the proper mindset of leadership. Moses still, he said, it's a burden and they want flesh. I didn't birth them into the world. They're your people, God. And so if you can't help me get her done, just kill me. Cast me aside. Take me out of the way that someone who can. Right? We see the same thing, the same idea when the kingdoms split. And well, one of them always get those born boys mixed up. One of them followed the counsel of the elders and the other the counsel of his peers. And uh, the one uh, from, the, from his peers said, you need to chastise these people. And so and the, the elder said, if you'll love these people and serve them and help them. Uh, but he chose the younger. Why? Pride. No, no individual is fit for leadership who is not first willing to judge themselves. And to say, woe is me, for I am undone. Um. And so he chose the younger and the kingdom split. There was the choice to serve God's people. There was the choice to punish God's people. He chose the punishment. And so, why? Because of the whole pride and the whole power and all that other kind of thing. You see it all through the passage of Scripture. And what did it breed? Just like the Bible said, it brought uh, bred contention and strife, divisiveness. Well, all of this we've tried to say as we considered Moses, the one thing that they did not appreciate, they didn't appreciate his, his marriage, his motive, his mandate, his, his, his mannerism. They didn't appreciate his mourning. And I'm telling you, it's a terrible thing in the work of the Lord. You know, it's almost like some people sense when there's blood in the water. Boy, and that preacher, he's demonstrating some weakness. Let's finish him off. But I would remind you, based on Moses' illustration here, never mistake meekness for weakness. Moses knew he was nothing. It was God they needed to worry about. So he fell before them and before God and he even told God, just kill me. Here's my point. God had miraculously provided manna for them. God provided for them Moses, the meekest man, the Bible said, a leader that they should have appreciated. You see what I'm saying? So the point, again, uh, as we bring it to, uh, to, the, to the conclusion, uh, is this, that they were not, they refused, if you will, they would not be satisfied with God. They wanted something else. They thought they knew better. And the end result was they failed in their steadfastness before God. 
And if you and I will just take a moment to let the Spirit of God search our heart and mind this morning, we'll realize the same thing. That the moment, the moment that I have in my life failed to be satisfied with the goodness of God is the moment that the murmuring and the complaining and the discontentment begins to set in. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to throw in the towel and go do something else. That's failure in steadfastness. Be careful. God is a good God. And here's my point. I've said it before a while back. If you will not be satisfied in Him, you will not be satisfied. That's what it boils down to. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer.